so far to Harbor Wolf. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our sand. Over the years, a lot of different ideas have been poured into the industry of space travel. From sounding rockets to orbital capsules, from lunar landers to reusable space planes, from aerospike engines to landable first stage boosters. The possibilities seem endless, limited only by the amount of money people are willing to pour into them. There's a lot of speculative space tech that has never made it past the drawing board. Taurus rings, rotating space stations that would use their own spin to create artificial gravity. Practically impossible megastructures like Dyson spheres that would be built around a star in order to harness its energy output. The many currently infeasible reactionless drives that can move a spacecraft without actually expelling fuel. Future space travel is speculation and imagination central, and today I'd like to talk about one particular kind of tech that would never end up being built. Nuclear pulse propulsion. Cool name, right? Even cooler when you realize it's a spaceship that's literally powered by setting off nukes behind it. In 1947, with the atomic bomb being a brand new technology with seemingly limitless possibilities, nuclear pulse propulsion was first suggested by Stanislaw Ulam, a Polish scientist who had participated in the Manhattan Project. Inspired by a concept first thought up by Robert Heinlein in a novel, what if, he said, we set off a nuclear explosion behind a spacecraft, mount a shock-absorbing plate onto the back of it, and push ourselves forward with the energy of the explosions. According to his calculation, the right design could result in specific impulses, which is a measure of engine efficiency, of around 6,000 seconds. That's about 13 times more efficient than the NASA Space Shuttle's RS-25 main engines firing in vacuum. With further refinement of the design, it was believed the specific impulse could be pushed all the way to an unfathomable 100,000 seconds, creating thrusts in the millions of tons and allowing a much larger spacecraft to be built. All of this led to Project Orion, several attempts to design a feasible spacecraft that utilized this new propulsion method. Much of the focus, as with many things space travel related, was on weight restrictions. It was realized that the smallest practical vehicle would be determined by the smallest achievable bomb yield, the smallest conceived designs would have no uses except as orbital test vehicles, and still have an overall mass of around 880 tons. As a result, the team began to focus on what could be done with larger designs, the biggest being what was called the Super Orion. It would have a diameter of 400 meters, over 1,000 bombs weighing 3,000 tons each, and a total mass of around 8 million tons. It was effectively the size of an entire city, prompting the designers to contemplate the possibility of an interstellar arc, a self-sustaining vessel that could carry an entire population to a new star system over multiple generations. Parts of its design were incomplete, with the researchers stating that the techniques and materials required wouldn't be developed for another decade or more. So, what could it achieve? Many of the smaller Orion designs were intended for single-stage trips to Mars and back, or a similarly constructed trip to one of the moons of Saturn. On the other hand, physicist Freeman Dyson performed some analysis on Orion designs that could possibly reach Alpha Centauri, our nearest star aside from the Sun. His focus was on the pusher plate that would absorb the impact of the explosions, concluding that it would need to be around 20 kilometers in diameter. He called this the energy-limited Orion spacecraft. It's a copper plate that's roughly the size of a small town all on its own. This would be required for the plate to effectively absorb the explosion's impact while also not melting itself in the process. It would need a cooldown of roughly 100 seconds between explosions, and then once all of the bombs were detonated, it would take Orion roughly 1,000 years to reach Alpha Centauri, traveling at roughly 0.3% the speed of light. With this not-so-ideal possibility staring him in the face, Dyson considered an alternative that could both improve performance and reduce size and cost, the momentum-limited pusher plate design. This would substitute the primary plate with an ablation coating of the exposed surface to get rid of excess heat. The limitation is then only that of the shock absorber's ability to transfer momentum from the accelerated plate to the vehicle. This would allow one explosion pulse every three seconds, and instead of a mean acceleration of 0.00003 Gs for 100 years, this would have a mean acceleration of 1 g for 10 days. 
the momentum limited pusher plate design would get Orion to Alpha Centauri in 133 years, a tenth of the time of the energy limited option, and would reach a maximum velocity of 3.3% the speed of light. Of course, Project Orion was not without its potential problems. Some of them are quite obvious, we're talking about a spaceship powered by nuclear explosions after all, but some are a little more subtle. Many surrounded the pusher plate. What is the best way to prevent the explosives eroding away the plate? Would the turbulence of the explosions cause faster erosion? How do you even test a plate like this considering you'd need thousands of explosions in a single location? And, the biggest and most obvious question, what are the long-term effects on and around Earth of detonating multiple nuclear explosives in nearby space? A lot of speculation was made at the time, but frequently the answer would be, we won't know without physically testing it out, an answer rendered mostly moot in the 21st century with the advent of computer simulations. We now know that Orion rockets would have caused electromagnetic pulses that could both damage satellites and ground electronics. They would flood the Van Allen radiation belts with high energy radiation and make them even more dangerous than they currently are. There are a number of reasons why Project Orion never came to be. Safety concerns, feasibility of design, and potential costs were all factors, but what drove the nail in the coffin was the Partial Test Ban Treaty of 1963. Signed by the governments of the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and the United States, the treaty prohibited test detonations of nuclear weapons except for those conducted underground. And yes, the treaty extended into space. After 1963, high-altitude nuclear tests were no longer allowed, and many ideas like Project Orion would be laid to rest. But, is the idea of nuclear pulse propulsion completely dead? Not quite. In 1973, Project Daedalus was conducted, a plan to design a plausible uncrewed interstellar probe to the nearby Barnard star. It relied on the perfection of fusion technology, which is something we still haven't worked out even today. Similarly, Project Longshot from 1987 proposed an uncrewed mission to Alpha Centauri B, but also relied on technology that doesn't yet exist. Maybe someday, but as of now, it looks like we're stuck with liquid-fueled bell nozzle rockets. I say that like it's a bad thing. If you like this video, please give it a like. If you want to see more, please subscribe and turn on the bell for notifications. If you want to support me further, consider becoming a member or a patron or checking out my merch or my Amazon links. Thank you and I will see you over the curve, Space Cowboys. In a fast cosmic arena. Imagine self-importance, the delusion that we have some...